Here's a corner of the automotive landscape you may not know. We're in Latvia to sample some automotive oddities. So when it comes to cars, we in the West historically have been absolutely spoiled for choice from Alpha to Xenos, there's pretty much something for everybody. But east of the Iron Curtain, historically, there's been quite a lot less choice, particularly when it comes to, to Russian cars. And I'm kind of curious, are they any good? Are they kind of retro cool? Are they just rusty rubbish? So we're here to try a pair of communist Cold War classics. Let's see what we've got. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Excellent. Vaz 2106. Yes. What's this? This is a second generation Volga. This is the Gaz 24. This was something very special in its day. We should call it Gary. Yeah, yeah, like an over-familiar plumber. Was this in a Bond film? This was the baddies car in Octopussy. So 1983, I remember seeing these bombing around. They don't look quite so mean in white. The vast majority of them were black. And yeah, they're quite a sinister looking thing when they're painted black. But this is lovely. It's been nicely restored. This is proper chrome. They're called these belims, as in the feeder things on Wales. Yeah. Nice little touch. Proper chrome handles. Look at this. This is solid, isn't it? The weight of that. What does it weigh? You're a geek. 1.4 tonnes. Wow. So, I mean, that doesn't sound a lot these days, but that was a hefty car when this was made. This is a Fiat 124 yeah. built in Russia at the Toliati plant. My uncle Ted had one of these in Orange in England and it rusted away to nothing. <laughs> but it was cool and I always absolutely loved it and I've always wanted to drive one. But you just don't see them in England anymore. No, no. It's a Vaz, we should call it Keith. And it won't be the first time it's had a couple of strapping young men inside him. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Fiat 124 but with drum brakes on the back, thicker steel and a couple of other little tweaks. But this was actually European car of the year in 1964-ish, yeah. I think it was. Yeah. But you can still buy this new in 2006, and it's mental. That late? Yeah, it's mental to think that you could buy such an outdated car so late. But they sold it late because, although it was outdated, these are tough, these are built. These are built for Siberia. I've got a bit of a theory that if this had a BMW or an Alfa Romeo badge on it, people would be pleasuring themselves raw because it's got all the ingredients of a really cool classic car. Manual gearbox, three box saloon, rear wheel drive, a little bit of rally heritage as well. I think they actually rallied these and that's super cool, but it's a larder and you know, we in the West perhaps don't appreciate these for the tough little boxes that they are and it does look solid. I cannot wait to drive this. So road trip time then, where are we going? We're going to where communism checked out. Oh right, okay. You're gonna like this. Excellent. <laughs> I'm actually very happy to be driving this Vaz 2106, otherwise known as a, a Lada 1600. And the story behind this model is that an Italian communist by the name of Togliatti opened a factory in Russia in a town called Togliatti, named in his honor, specifically to build this model. And they built millions and millions of them. And they don't make millions of cars if they're bad, you know? They've got to be pretty successful in that market, otherwise nobody would rely on the things. I own a 1970s Fiat at home in England, and there's a lot of similarities. The door pulls the same, the winders the same, some of the switch gears the same. There were some fundamental differences specifically for the Russian market, such as the steel was 10% thicker. So this car weighs around 1,100 kilos as opposed to something like 900 odd kilos for the Italian version because they need to keep that Russian weather off. Out in Siberia, you don't want any rust, you don't want suspension falling to bits. They switched out disc brakes on the back for aluminium drum brakes instead because they're easy to service and live with. And I have to say, when I drive this now in Riga traffic, well, this one kind of bounces on its nose a little bit because I don't think those rear drum brakes are doing anything at all. And in the boot, there's a really fantastic leather tool roll with a kit so owners, even ham-fisted idiots like me, can service and keep this thing running on their own. And that makes ownership proposition today as a classic quite appealing because there's nothing on this car that will break that I can't fix myself. 
and I'm an idiot. This is a really nice thing to drive. It's not particularly heavy, it's rear wheel drive. The steering's unassisted, so the steering's fairly precise. And yeah, you've got that slightly laggy feeling when you drive a car that's running fuel through a carburetor, but actually you feel quite nicely connected, even through this tiny thin rim steering wheel. Yes, if you judge this car by modern standards, it's primitive and noisy and baggy and the brakes are rubbish and everything else, but actually, Compared to the alternatives, this is a really great design. This wasn't designed to be a luxury car to impress your neighbours. This was a car designed to get you across the Russian steppes and fetch your herd and get people to university. And, and in that, I think it's a great success. This is Spilva, I think it's pronounced. It's the old abandoned airport built by the Russians who left here in 1991. Obviously it's no longer used today, but a classic piece of communist architecture as are these. Well, after 91, when the Russians left, I mean, these things really sort of fell out of favor. They were a little bit unloved when all the Western imports started to come in, but. I think they're getting a little bit more nostalgic for them. The, the kind chap that lent us these two said that they're you know, hugely in demand. I think he's painted them white as wedding cars and, he, and he's booked out most weekends. The tide has changed, isn't it? They're, uh, they're certainly becoming collectible classics here. I think it's interesting how communism and capitalism has ebbed and flowed from east to west over the years and so have tastes in cars because we got these. These were big in the UK. I mean, they sold, I think, a third of a million of these in the UK and then they all ended up being shipped back to Russia because the guys wanted them there for spares. And you don't find them in the UK. It actually has been quite difficult to find these even here in, in Latvia, which hasn't had communism for 20, mm. 30 odd years. So uh, it's, I think it's kind of a reflection, but there is, you're right, there's a definitely a growing love for this kind of stuff because it's so different to what we drive new today. I've got ashtrays in the door and that's just brilliant, isn't I've it? I've got six ashtrays. Six ashtrays? <laughs> Four gears and six ashtrays. Non-assisted steering and a really thin steering wheel and yeah. because the car leans so much it's a bit like karting where you, you actually feel yourself leaning into the corners uh, to get it to go around the way you want. And I love that, mm. that feeling. You can't replicate that, you know, that's, that's mine's something a, Mine's a weird special. mix of the very delicate, it's got a tiny little wand indicator and very thin rimmed steering wheel. The gearbox is actually quite nice. And then it's got a bloody tractor engine in the front that's <laughs> chugging <laughs> away. The, the brakes are, are woeful. The steering is, well, it's not got any power steering. It is a bit of a barge to drive. I think that was one of the things you, you kind of touched on there with the engine that actually did kill these, not only in the west, but in the yeah. east, was yeah. catalytic converter. Driving that, I'm getting a nice hum of, of pollution, which I kind of like, you know. It's all right, it's not exactly smoking. This car's in great condition. Yeah. yeah. But it's a reminder that they're not as environmentally as they should be, which is why they stopped selling them in the UK. And I think it's probably also in Russia, people got just sick of the, uh, sick of the pollution that they cause. But there's very few of these on the road now. So I think that the little bit of Pong we're emitting is no, uh, no great problem. Certainly nothing to the uh, Cold War jets that blasted out of here <laughs> back in the day. No. We still have to decide. Would well, you want to come for a spin? Yeah, let's, let's see if the Volga is anything like as good as the Lada. Come on. Let's get, let's get in Gary. <laughs> We're in your Gary. <laughs> We're in a GAS, which stands for Gorky Automobile Fabrica or Factory or something like that. It was a car plant on the banks of the River Volga, about 200 miles north of Moscow. This is actually a GAS 24. I suppose to a man of a certain age, it looks a little bit like a 1960s Vauxhall Victor. Yeah, or an Opal Record for a Continental Views, yeah. or a Dodge, what is it? Dodge Dart, I think I read somewhere, that it looks a little bit like. It is quite American. But that's the problem, isn't it? You see, we're almost judging it as a 60s or 70s car, but this car actually dates from 1983. You could get some pretty good cars in 1980. And you look at this and, and you judge it as a 60s car because of the square dash and the, 
and the Bakelite and the veneer and just the feel of the thing. But what came out in 83? For the E30? Yeah, Mark II Golf. The um, E24 635 CSI shark nose, yeah. which is incredibly modern by comparison. Perhaps the most important car that came out in the early 80s was the Mercedes 190E, which of course this was I suppose the equivalent at the time, isn't it? It was the car that was driven by executives, it was driven by the social elite, the political elite. It really was one of the most aspirational cars that you could get, or you know, people in Russia could even realistically aspire to own. Now, even if you had the money, you couldn't just go out and buy this car, you had to be assigned it. You get, had to get the paperwork and the permits that you could go out and procure one. But it is pretty unrefined. You compare that to the Mercedes 190, we've got huge amount of wind noise and creaks and groans. You can see why modern Russians pick Mercedes over the equivalent Volga, perhaps. And that might sound a bit harsh, but yeah. Yeah. You can see why these fell out of favor. But like car ownership in, in Russia versus car ownership in the West, particularly back in the 70s, for example. Yeah, you've got to remember that. I think in America it was uh, two adults to every one car. And in Russia at the time, it was like one in 57. Yeah, and if they had the money, would those other 56 have actually bought one of these? I think the other 56 would have bought my larder. That's what I think. Mm. I have been in one of these before. I was in one of these in Moscow, and it was a cab way back yeah, when. Yeah, well, that's the weird thing. Even though this was probably, there's only one below, sort of the Zill limousines and the Chaika limousines. 99% of Russian taxi cabs were actually Volgas. So that would be a little bit like in Britain if they, replaced all the minicabs with detuned Bentley Continentals. <laughs> but this is no Bentley Continental, is it? <laughs> no. <laughs> Which gear was that? Three and a half. <laughs> it is entertaining though. What else did they do? They did this? loads of versions. I mean, they did an estate version that was used as ambulances. There was a four by four version. There was a convertible that was used in military parades. That'd be cool. But the coolest, the best version by far has to be the KGB spec. V8, 4.5 litre, police interceptor. But when in Rome, vodka, pickled fish and a game of top trumps to see which car wins. Okay, so we're playing top trumps, but the loser for each hand has to drink a shot of Stolichnaya. Okie dokie. Well, I'll start with ones I know I'm going to win then. Bring so, it on, bring it on. Brake horsepower. I have 95 brake horsepower. Yeah, I got 75. So you win that one. So I. Yeah. So I will follow that up with. <laughs> 0 to 60. I think I'm right in saying that my 0 to 60 is 14.7 seconds. I think it's 15 or 16 seconds. Can we let this burn down, me? <laughs> oh, Jesus. Right, you win. Absolutely. No, but you can pick the next category then. Mm. Yeah, give me a minute. <laughs> Here's an easy one because the Lada was a hugely popular car. It's made for the masses. How many sold? Oh, God. Okay. Right, go on. I'm not sure because I have been drinking, but I think the answer is like 10 to 20 million. Right, well, I think mine is only something like 600,000, but it was so exclusive, you couldn't even buy it. So, you lose. that's me, isn't it, anyway? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Don't fight it. Right. <coughs> okay. Well, one I know I'm going to win. Without doubt, my car has to be the most sinister car, especially in KGB Black, was one of the scariest cars ever made. We played Top Trumps as kids, right? And I don't ever remember most sinister being a category when it comes to cars. That's got it. You had to be a mayor, or more or less, an official of that sort of rank to own mine. Right, I can beat you. Um, the town, Togliatti, that made my larder had the mayor murdered by the <laughs> Mafia. So I win that one. Are you sure? 
What about the most charismatic famous owner? Oh, Vladimir Putin? Like him or loathe him, you don't get more charismatic than that. Oh, I was going to say my uncle Ted. He was, <laughs> really, he, was a, he was in the Air Force, he was a real child. I'm sure he's a lovely bloke, but um, I actually think my car has also saved the most lives because the estate version we actually used as ambulances. Ambulances? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, am ambulances. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't think the Lauder 1600 or the Vaz 2106 or 2103, I don't think they ever saved many lives because they actually scored zero out of five stars <laughs> in the Russian equivalent of the NCAP safety test. It's a bit of a grisly stat, but it, yeah. it may have motorized the millions, but it probably <laughs> killed a few of them as well. That's a grisly statistic you don't want to dwell on. So, should we call a taxi? Yeah. <sighs> I hope he's not a bloody <laughs> vulgar. So Russian cars, what have we actually learned? On one hand, we've sampled two archetypal Russian machines, the Volga and the Lada. But the truth is, just like Western cars, they're extremely different. The Volga, on one hand, feels like a bad copy of a bad American car, but still has its charms. The Lada is from the other end of the spectrum. It's light, it's easy to drive, and it's great fun. But it feels very much like the Fiat that it is underneath. So outwardly, yes, they're very Russian. Underneath, they're extremely different and very, very interesting cars to drive. We have had a blast. Опять эти стереотипы про русских.